Good morning and welcome. This is uh, November So Fun and this is Quality Sewing and Vacuum and we are in the Pacific Northwest so it is uh, still morning over here even though it's afternoon where you are maybe. Um, but welcome to So Fun today and we have a lot of fun stuff to explore with you and uh, my name is Gail Nikashonis and this is Ann Almond and we both work for Quality here. And what I want to start with is uh, we're having a little contest. We have a patch that OESD was kind enough to make for us and uh, digitize. And you are welcome to go download this for free on our website, stitch it out, and then put it on something. Put it on a bag, put it on a jacket, put it on whatever you would like, and send us a picture, and you'll be entered for a drawing. So that's a little contest we're going. This is um, to celebrate our 35 years. We've been in business, and uh, I hope that you've been with us for some of those 35 years, if not all. All right. So Anne is going to start off uh, with our first book. Actually, I'm going to do door prize. You're going to do door prize first? All right. Um, talk about oh, door talk prizes. About gotcha. Yeah. Um, we are going to be giving out three door prizes for those of you who are watching right now. And all you have to do is like or comment, um, and then we'll choose three individuals. Um, three additional door prizes will be chosen um, from those of you who post a show and tell picture. But we're asking you to please wait at least 30 to 45 minutes after the presentation's over because we have a lot of housekeeping issues to get things uh, set up for that. And um, you can uh, post your picture and then um, on Monday, November 9th, by noon Pacific Standard Time, remember we are Pacific Standard Time, um, we will choose uh, the winners for the door prizes. So um, I also wanted to just give a shout out to our Canadian friends. We have quite a few ladies who attend our seminars um, from Canada, and I just wanted to give a shout out to them and just say we're still thinking about you and uh, can't wait till we can get back together. This program has actually been going for about 27 years, and so um, we are excited to, to bring the things that we have uh, prepared for you today. So I am going to start out with um, creating with cork fabric. Do you want to tell them how to find the list? And, oh, go ahead. You know it better than me. So um, there is a link on uh, the URL or wherever you're watching this, um, whether it's live or later on and you're able to go in and print out this price list and it's going to have all the items that we talk about today and um, you can take notes and you know make little stars and you can either order those on our website or you can go into one of the stores and um, pick them up or order them thank you okay we're going to start out talking about cork and um I know Gail's used cork a lot. I've used cork um, ever since it came out. And there's some things that you need to know when you sew with cork. Um, there's actually two classifications of cork. One is called touch and one is called pro. The touch corks you cannot iron, but the pro corks you can because they are a cork fabric. And the um, cork that we have for you today, and Gail's going to be uh, showing you some of the samples and colors when she does her, her demo um, that we have available for you. Um, but they're all the pro cork, and you can interface them, you can press them, and um, that that's a good thing to know because you may want to do that. Um, when I made one of my bags, I did interface the cork for the, the flap, and it worked beautifully. Um, cork will either come in 27 or 54 inches wide, and usually they do an 18-inch for the packages and you can also buy it by the yard. Now a lot of people wonder what kind of a needle that you should use and they suggest that you use a Microtex needle 
um, an 80-12 or a 90-14, depending on how thick your cork is. But I like to always use the smallest needle possible because you get smaller holes. So I would start out with an 80-12. You can also use a universal needle if you don't have the Microtex. Now, one of the important things with cork is that you need to make sure that you have at least 3 eighths to a half an inch uh, seam allowance. There are many, many different patterns for corks, and the book that we have for you today is from Sally Tomato. Many of you may be, <clears throat> excuse me, familiar with her. She does wonderful findings for purses, and this is her first book out. She has a lot of different patterns. Um, another thing that you need to know about sewing with cork is you can't use pins. And so what we've done is we have brought in some jumbo wonder clips, and I'll be showing you those in just a, a few minutes uh, when I do my demos. But you want to use some type of a clip, and the jumbo wonder clips work great with cork. So, and someone asked if you can use cork in place of fabric in projects, and especially in clothing. In quilting, in clothing. I, clothing, clothing. Oh, clothing. Um, actually, the book has some some uh, one project for appliqueing on to to uh, clothing with cork ac appliques. I believe it was a jacket. Yeah, so, it was a jacket. I don't so, know that I would wash. Cork um, can't be washed. You yeah. can wipe it, yeah. but it can't be washed. But if you just put it on a jacket, a jean jacket, I think is what they did, you could do appliques, but you can't use it really for uh, clothing. Okay. That's a good question, though. Gail's going to show you in just a few minutes how to cut cork on your cutting machines and things like that. One of the things to remember about cork is that it is 100% sustainable. And so if you're worried about um, the environment and sustainable things, um, it, it's great that way. Um, the newer corks are really pliable. And so I'm going to start out with, I'm going to start out with this bag here. This is the crossbody bag from the book, and this is the um, chevron cork. It's very, very pliable. You can see I've made a half inch handle here, and notice how pliable it is. I did interface the, the flap with uh, SF-101, and then the book also has uh, instructions on making uh, your tassels and things like that. The body of the bag is just a home deck weight twill. And one of the things that I learned, I used to teach a lot of handbag classes many years ago. And one thing I learned is if you want the body in your bag and you don't want to put either your Annie Soft and Stable next to your fashion fabric, you can put it next to your lining and you get the same beautiful shape with that. And that's what I did with this. I used um, a lightweight uh, uh, foam interfacing here. And then this just has a little snap here. Very quick, very easy to do. It goes together really fast. The second bag that I made, this is the shopper's tote. Now, you can decide how much body you want in your bag. Um, the pocket is made out of one of our corks here. The handles, these are very, very easy to make. You just uh, cut a strip, and then you'll finish it off, and you'll sew it here, and then this just lays down flat here. Um, this is actually uh, a home deck weight twill, and I've interfaced it with uh, decor bond. If you're making purses, decor bond gives you a nice, stable bag. Now, if it's a shopping bag, you may not want it to be this stable, so just choose a different interfacing that's not quite as stiff. And then it's just lined on the inside. And an easy way to put your snaps on is to applique them to a piece of cork, and then you stitch the cork to the lining of the bag. But this just goes very, very quickly. The customer is wondering what color that blue cork is. 
or what we it comes have. out of the seaside the package. seaside package it's something that we're actually selling this month. yes we are selling this uh cork right here it's a blue there's also the green that comes out of the package and this is this is a little box uh tote thing and this is another one of the colors so we have the blue here we have the the uh, seafoam green one of the things that i love about the corks that we use this month is that they are so easy to work with this bag right here this little pouch it has nothing besides cork there's no lining there's no interfacing there's nothing you can make this up in 30 minutes and um, i just added a zipper here you can see inside it's just cork and then i added the little handles here and i ran out of this cork i used my uh, whole package and some projects so i just added some decorative stitches here on the handles to coordinate it and we're going to be talking about using your ma machine decorative stitches here in just a minute so gail i'm going to go ahead and you want to do your other bag before we Oh, yes, I forgot about this. Thanks. This is another pattern out of the book, and it is for an applique uh, clutch. Reverse. And I decided to make it out of some wonderful leather that I had. And so it's just very, very plain. Now, Gail's going to be showing you the pattern when she uh, does the scan and cut. And it is supposed to be raw edge along this here but what i did was i added about a, a three-eighths to a half inch seam allowance and then this is put together traditionally with a lining and you don't have any raw edges around here because i didn't know how the leather would work with the lining and so i just did a traditional method you put the zipper in in the flat and so it's this is another 30 minute project it does not take long to make it and um you can line it if you want to i don't gail you didn't line yours Just the crack you don't case. have to yeah. so with the cork nothing frays or anything like that and to clean it all you have to do is just take a damp cloth and wipe it down and so those are the projects that i did for this month Wonderful, Anne. Okay, so uh, now to the projects that I did. Now, the uh, bags in here, you can mix and match uh, between home deck fabrics and the cork and the um, faux leather or craft techs or anything. Um, the bags will work with, with all of those things. But this is uh, one of the projects that I did out of there. Um, this is an applique tote. I did change it uh, just a little bit. I added this row of leather here. Um, and I pulled the fabric uh, from the lining out and put it on the outside because it was so pretty. Then I kind of took one of the shapes out of my fabric to make my applique rather than um, the leaf appliques that are in the book. So they do give you the patterns for um, their little uh, leaves. leaves. Yeah, but mine are more like feathers. So these were cut on the scanning cut, um, and I do have some leather involved. This is cork that is paisley. This is on our list. Um, the Paisley and the Chevron are a little bit different size. And I'm gonna duck under here for a sec. These are gonna be large packages. This is going to be what you get. You can see where I cut the piece out that I needed for my bag. So you get a nice large chunk of either the Paisley or the Chevron. And it's a little bit uh, thinner. Yes. Now the other um, cork, has three different colors to a package and they are 12 by 18 um, for all three pieces are 12 by 18 so and there was a question did you use faux leather yes they are faux leather um, the second project that I did out of that book is a little coin purse or clutch this uses one of those wire uh, frames, and they are clamp frames. They're available 
um, all over the internet. I think we have a few on our website as well. Um, this is the green. Again, this is the blue. And there is a, what they call a birch, which is a light, light tan that does not have any um, silver or gold or anything in it. Those are the three colors in the seaside. I'll show you what those are over in my other, um, when I do the demo. And then if we want to wander over here to the wall, or I can just go get it and bring okay. it over. Um, we have the last item here. This is a placemat that is made out of cork. This is the chocolate brown. And I've also bound it with um, the tan that has the gold highlights. So as you can see, cork you can embroider on. Uh, you can quilt through. Uh, this pattern is uh, built in out of my sewing machine, and it kind of matched my um, fabric on the back. So that was the reason for that choice. There is a placemat idea in the book. Thank you, Lori. We had a customer ask about how much is in each of the packages. Yes. So, so as I showed, um, hopefully that answered the question. So the the Paisley and the Chevron boxes are uh, 51 inches by 19 inches. And I showed you the big piece, right? Um, the other packages look like this. So this is the seaside that we've been talking about, light green, blue, and birch. And there's all three colors in a package, and each of these pieces is 12 by 18. We all have four different color selections, and I have them laid out right over here. Carrie, if Somebody you want. has a quick question. Yep. Um, how would you compare the cork to craft text in terms of ease of use to working with the material? I would say they're about the same. They're about the same weight, about the same stiffness. Um, this is uh, smoother. You know, it just feels soft and silky when you touch it, when you pet it. <laughs> um, and, but they both cut beautifully on the scanning cut, which is what I'm going to do next. And I'll show you my last you, sample right over there. Is the cork just on the border? This is a binding. And this is cork. So that's all cork. This is so all cork. Yeah. They would, they would wipe that clean then? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yes. One of the things that um, when, you, when, you look, when you use the Eversone, at least the ones in the package, they, they call them cork fabric because they're a certain percentage of cork and they're a certain percentage of fabric, so they act like a fabric. We do have um, a door prize to give out right now. And um, this is for Susan Moe. And if Susan would contact us, we have a rotary cutter for her. Susan Moe, congratulations. All right, so again, in uh, this size package, three 12 by 18 inch uh, cuts. We have um, the seaside, mint green, blue, and birch, which uh, look like this on the scan and cut mat here. We have lucky gold, which is a green, a natural with gold flecks, and the chocolate brown. So those three are in the same package. Then we have Ooh la la is that natural with gold, the chocolate brown, is that black, oh that's black, and um, what they call peony, which is that red color, and then we have the classic, which is the birch, the natural, and this is a smoke, which is more of a gray instead of a black or a brown. And they all are this size, which is perfect placemat size. Um, I did not trim at all. This is the full piece that I made into my placemat. So um, this is one of those where it's, a, it's an individual placemat. It's not going to be a, a set of eight or anything. So <laughs> um, you could be all different colors. All right. So the last sample out of the book that I wanted to share with you and uh, what I'm going to demo is how you can cut this stuff on uh, the scan and cut. 
So this is the same clutch, and it's called a reverse applique clutch because you take the outside fabric, in this case, um, this natural cork, and you cut holes in it. And then you have another fabric show through from the back side. And in this case, um, this hot pink or um, orchid color is Craftex. So um, the Craftex shows through to make the flowers, and it also makes the lining. So as Anne mentioned, my seams are on the outside edge. You put the zipper in when it's flat, and it is super easy to do. I also have um, a matching out of the birch, either um, a keychain, or you could do it in matching fabric and make the handle for the purse, uh, whatever you would like. So these are actually little, um, the Asian flowers with the little, um, tuck in the end of the petal, and you can see it a little bit better on um, that one. And they cut out, even with the little notch in the corner of the petal, even on the little guys. So, um, what we're gonna do is bring up that design, and this is something that I created in my canvas. I brought in the flower and I just multiplied it across my screen. I have both the purse and the keychain in here, um, but I'm going to choose that particular file and I'm going to go in and isolate um, my keychain up here and get rid of everything else down below. So I'm going to go into edit and I'm going to um, get rid of these guys down here. So I'm isolating all of those pieces down there. There we go. And I will trash. Okay, so I'm just gonna make a keychain. And I'm also gonna go in there, as I brought this file in, it's in about 12 different pieces. Each flower is separate along with the keychain part. And I'm gonna go in and, and select all of those and group them because if I need to move this to fit my fabric I'm going to want to move it all at the same time not each individual flower so now I'm going to take a picture of my mat and while that scans um, I did want to mention there are a couple of different blades for this machine there's your black blade that is for um, this is the scanning cut by the way uh, DX version 230 but there's a black blade and a tan blade. The tan blade is labeled a thin fabric blade, and it really means thin fabric. Um, I cut a bunch of cork out with my black blade, and it cuts beautifully, and it cuts just fine. It's a thicker product. Then I put in my tan blade to cut out a piece of fabric, and then I went back to cut out some more cork, and I had forgotten to switch blades. And I was trying to cut cork with my tan one, and my machine actually told me that my material was too thick to cut. And it didn't really say it's because you didn't change your blade. It just said it's too thick. So if you don't know any better and you don't know that it will actually work, it might discourage you from trying to cut those thick items. Um, just be sure you have the right blade in. Okay, so if you can and what mat did you use? Uh, this is the fabric mat. And this is the brand new um, mat that they have come out with. Um, this is supposed to be tan. <laughs> so they are kind of color coding things. Um, they have a light blue vinyl um, blade and a light blue vinyl um, mat, but this one is super sticky for fabric, and since this is a fabric type product, um, I went ahead and used it for this, and I'm also gonna use this mat um, when I cut a piece of applique fabric here in a few minutes. So I have a nice photo on my screen here of what my material looks like on my mat. That is going to allow me to place my keychain design. Now it's a little bit dark. I couldn't see where my keychain was, so I'm going to go to background and do a grayscale. So now I can actually see where it's at. And I'm gonna pull it down and I'm gonna cut one out of the gold to match my clutch. So I can use um, the move button or I can use um, just my fingers to place that where I want to. I say okay. 
I say cut. Now, if you've got a DX or are thinking about one, um, everything is auto automatic. I don't have to set any blade depth. I don't have to set any pressure. It is just going to go in and cut that for me. And we are going to go in and speed it up just a little bit because it tells me it's going to take 12 minutes, but we don't have 12 minutes, so we're going to go fast. <laughs> yes. What is the name of the blade you're using to cut the I am using the all-purpose blade. It is the standard uh, cut blade. In the machine, you get two, um, the thin fabric and um, the standard. So while that cuts, um, we also, or I did anyway, used um, this mat to cut out my applique fabrics for my um, applique either with Farm Fresh, there's a lot of applique, or with the um, towels that we're going to show later. So. Should have one cut finished. Well, here it is, right here. It's finished. <laughs> um, but that's what we're doing. We're cutting out um, those little flowers. So, you know, you're going to get the idea. I'm going to go ahead and pause. Does speeding up the scan and cut diminish the quality of your cut? No, not in this case. Um, it will be just fine. Some materials you do want to cut slower. Um, but I'm just going to remove the outside. The first thing it actually cut was the outside of my keychain. So I knew that I did have that on there. And it's not going to have all the flowers on there because I stopped it. But it is a sticky mat. But that's where it left off. So I don't know if you can see. Yeah. So that's where they cut the little petals. Can you just remind them what mat you're using? I am using the fabric mat. This is a brand new mat um, from Scan and Cut, and they have actually taken the high tech support sheets and placed them on the mat permanently. So it's super sticky, and you can just clean it with um, wet wipes or baby wipes, anything that doesn't have alcohol, and you don't have to strip this off and put on another one, which is very, very nice, but you get a nice, nice sticky cork. Okay, so. One more question? Yes, ma'am. What would you recommend the settings be on the older scanning cuts? I would say, um, probably I would start at a pressure of three and a blade depth of three or four. You can always go deeper, but you can't uncut a mat. So you want to uh, make sure you start low and test. And test so and how often do you replace your mat um, when stuff doesn't stick to it anymore it really really depends on um, what you're cutting out how much stuff it leaves on the mat um, like I said you can get the bits off with um, baby wipes and um, yep all right yep Oh, okay. I guess I'm next. So we're going to talk about our Farm Fresh, which is our embroidery design collection from um, Lunchbox Quilts. Here's the package right here. Farm life and welcome to the farm and all about chickens and locally grown. There's tractors too, tractors and barns and chickens. So um, all of the designs in this, uh, this is an embroidery design collection, multi-format, fits um, all of your embroidery machines. These are um, individual stitch out designs. A lot of them are applique, so you can add fabrics, it makes them go faster. But if you wanted to do the quilt, or there's some wall hangings over there, um, you can, Cut them out. So if you want to make this quilt, once you sew out your little chick here, you need to know how big your block is going to be. 
they have a product called um, the Mark Block that goes with it. So for each of their quilt collections, they have a Mark Block. What that is is a series of templates. And these templates have the design on them. And then they have all the lines. So you would just place this over your chick after you've embroidered him out. And you just cut along these lines right here. And you know exactly um, where he's going to be in your little block. And all of your blocks go together and make um, these wonderful projects. And they're all the right size. Then you can add all your own wonderful quilting um, as you quilt the whole piece together. So that was one question that um, I had asked earlier if the quilting came with it and know you get to do your own. So yes. that's exciting. Yes. Stuff. So okay. I took um, just a step outside the box as always and put mine on to a notebook cover. And this is uh, the projects in a later book, but the decoration is the farm fresh. So I've got the welcome to the farm up here and the little tractor. I do actually happen to come from a farm and the family's still there. So this is just a nice little notebook that you can write down, you know, facts and figures and uh, different things. There's a little pocket and um, I made a little um, ribbon thing for a, a marker. Now this is again um, some full leather that we had and it's all ready for weather. So. All right, and then Anne, you want to share your uh, Well, I, I am a cowgirl at heart, and so I love anything farm, anything uh, animal, ranch, things like that. So I made a couple of projects, and um, I didn't want to do the whole quilt. I just wanted to do a wall hanging. So I'm going to go over here and tell you about the things that I made. Actually... Actually, right here, this is another sample. The sample up on uh, the big quilt and this table runner is from uh, the uh, designer from, from uh, Lunchbox Quilts. And look at the beautiful embroidery here. Um, you can see how beautiful it is. And then they've accented it with uh, wonderful quilting. And... Um, one of the things about this pattern is that you can make pillows out of it. You can make just a one block wall hanging. You could put these on dish towels, um, things like that. And so what I chose to do is I just did a three um, paneled wall hanging here. Um, my son lives on a farm and my daughter-in-law is a lover of animals. And so I decided that this would be something fun that, that she might enjoy. And so I decided to do the barn. I decided to do eggs because she does have chickens and they have a tractor. And I just thought this was really fun. Now, um, one of the things about this is that I didn't know how big to make my blocks. Um, I just did cut a piece of embroidery fabric, I starched it, I backed it with SF-101, put it in my hoop and hooped it with some tearaway stabilizer. And so I did it uh, bigger than what I thought I would need. And then the, the thought came to me, okay, so now how do I get the blocks all to match? There are different types of square up rulers on the market and you can look um, at your favorite uh, fabric store and they will probably have a square up ruler and that's what I did and with I decided how big I wanted the block to be and my square up ruler has four little holes one on each corner and so if I wanted a finished eight and a half inch block then I would go out to that uh, measurement and I just took a friction pen and marked it and then cut my blocks and that was just fun. I do have, um, I'm going to scan this, I just ran out of time and didn't get it done. I'm going to scan this in my uh, brother machine and then I'm going to add the quilting around it but that just didn't get done. Um, and then I'm going to go over here to this. Do we have two quick questions? Yes. What is SF-101? Okay, SF-101 is actually my favorite 
interfacing. It's called Shape Flex. It's by Pellon, and it is a woven fusible interfacing. It's about 20 inches wide, and you can use it on everything. Um, it, it's wonderful for backing anything. I use it on the linings of my purses. Now, if you want to uh, not, if you want to use fleece on a purse and you don't want that that fleece texture to come through, you interface it with some SF 101 and then you iron the fleece to the SF 101 and you'll get a nice smooth um, a smooth look. And, and so that's what I. One other question, somebody wanted to know the chicken wire, is that part of the design or is that quilting? This is quilting and this is what you will do on your own. The quilting does not come with, it's not digitized with the applique. But, your chicken wire is but my chicken wire fabric is just chicken wire fabric. <laughs> and so um, I, have, I haven't decided how I'm going to quilt it, but it will have some quilting there. Now, I wanted to do an apron, and uh, my daughter-in-law has chickens, she has peahens, she has all these different kinds of birds. I decided that I would make an apron where she could collect her eggs. And then this is a wonderful embroidery. Um, I just took a pre-purchased apron, and I added the rickrack uh, once I did the embroidery. And um, the, the pocket was just one big pocket, and I stitched it in half before I, um, well, actually, I didn't stitch it in half. I stitched it here, and I stitched it here. It is not stitched right here where the egg is, but just a fun project. Um, and I hope that, that you'll find it as fun as we found it. Okay, we're going to move back up here to the table. And we're going to talk about um, the hot stuff trivet. Um, these are really popular, and they are, this is a piece of silicone. And I have bought many different silicone hot pads and things like that. But isn't this kind of just boring? You know, you just see it. But what's exciting about this is that you can put a piece of fabric underneath it and turn it into something that has a little bit more pattern to it. And it's very easy to do. So I'm going to go ahead and move over to the wall over here. And I'm going to show you some of the things that um, Yell and I did. Turn around here so that you can hear me and see me. Um, this is the one that Gail did, and there's actually two options for binding the um, trivet. You can do just, a, I call it an envelope style, where you just put uh, right side to right side, stitch it, turn it inside out. You can do that with this, and that's what Gail has done uh, on this one and I've done it on this one as also. Now, one of the things about these trivets is they will hold, they are good up to 450 degrees. So you can set big platters on them. You can set your hot uh, pots from your stove and, and these are, are good up to 450 degrees. Now, this one right here, if you notice, it has a binding on it, and you can do the binding. What you're going to do to put this together is you have your fashion fabric, and this is our Washington State fabric that we all love, and then you have a piece of batting, and you're going to put that together, and you're, you're going to actually, this is a border that you stitch onto the trivet. Notice that I've done some just some quilting with my uh, stitches here. It's just uh, the serpentine stitch. You can use any type of quilting that you'd like. Um, I would suggest that you use 100% cotton batting and 100% cotton thread because it is going to have uh, something uh, hot on it. But really, this is going to um, 
This is going to protect your surfaces. This one right here, um, I made out of Christmas fabric and you can kind of, I don't know if you can see the Santa faces. And then from the walk book, quilting with your uh, walking foot, I just did this pattern on the back here. Um, so it, it turned out really fast and easy. Now, when we talk about our Take Two Fat Quarter book, one of the projects that I chose out of it was making hot mitts. And so I have a couple of hot mitts here that match um, each of the trivets and they go, uh, they make a nice gift. In fact, my daughter, a different daughter-in-law, um, asked me about this and maybe she's gonna get this for Christmas. One of the things that when we put our presentation together, um, we wanted to do some fast, easy projects that you could give as gifts for the holidays. And this is the mitt here. I, uh, I really like the pattern. It's easy, it's big enough, and um, it makes a great gift. And then can you wash those, those mats? Um, I would probably just wipe this off. I don't know that I would throw it in the washing machine, but that's a really good question. Um, it probably wouldn't hurt it too much. What does it say on the back of it? Yeah. Um, I wanted to show you this, this mitt that just fell down. I used just scraps to do these projects. And you can see this mitt has two different fabrics. It's because I had enough of each fabric to make the mitt. And these were from a collection and um, it's the same as my trivet here. So you can use scraps, it works really well. Um, and so, uh, Gail, have you found anything on that? It doesn't say, but I would definitely just wash it and dry it because we will up at 450 degrees. Yeah, so it's a silicone. I don't think you'd have a problem way. with it. But if you're going to do that, you might want to pre-wash your fabrics and uh, steam your batting so that it shrinks a little bit. Okay, back to the table. All right, our next book. Right? Yep. Okay, so this is the, this is the book. Uh, take two fat quarters. So every project in this book can be done with two fat quarters, or you can use yardage as well. Um, but uh, they are quick, easy projects, good for Christmas, good for gift giving. Um, trying to remember what I did. Um, I'll just talk about mine, then you can do your demo. So again, that notebook cover idea of the pattern for um, the cover itself is in the book. Also, um, my bag right here. Now this holds two bottles, wine bottles, uh, drink bottles. There's a little divider in the center here and it's all finished. I have kind of a, maybe a Valentine theme going. So um, very, very quick and easy. I thought the divider inside might be difficult, but it was, um, it was very easy to do. Got a boxed bottom. I did put a little stiffener in the bottom uh, to make everything stand up just fine. And my cable tie. I'm just going to run and get it and be right back, Carrie. You don't have to go anywhere. And I've got a couple more questions that you could answer while Gail is grabbing her things. What size needle did you use? And did you quilt before adding the silicone? Yes, you quilt before you add the silicone. And then um, I probably, I use, usually use just an 8012, or you could go to a 9014, just a universal. Um, I actually use Inspira needles. I really like them because they have a bigger eye, but any needle will work. And I always start with the smallest. Um, so I would just start with an 8012 probably. So the last item that I uh, did out of the book is called the cable tidy roll. Um, but what it's going to, it's got a little bag here and it snaps on. This is for all your electronic stuff or maybe makeup. You could put whatever you want in there. 
um, the oh adapter for the USB or uh, maybe your makeup in here and your uh, makeup brushes in here, but it also will hold these electrical cords and all those fun things. And then it all rolls up and it has another little set of snaps to fasten it all together. Another question customers had about the mitts that you made. Mm -hmm. What did you use for insulation and did you put silicone in there? Thank you. That is something I forgot to tell you. Thank you for that question. Um, I actually used scraps of batting, 100% cotton batting, and scraps of Insulbrite. And a lot of times you think that you have to have one big piece of Insulbrite or one big piece of batting. I just laid them together and zigzagged them. And we all have scraps, especially with Insulbrite. Um, it, it's, you know, you want to use as much as you can. And so I just, I just piece the Insulbrite together and the batting and that. And I do not have silicone in that. Okay. All right. It looks like, oh, you're going to go yep, through I'm your samples. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I've been doing this job for many, many years. And before we had embroidery machines, what did we use to embellish? we used our decorative machine stitches. I love using decorative machine stitches. And so in the book, and I was going to show you, um, I don't even know where did that other book go. This is yours. Oh, over there. No. No, it's right there on the stand. No, I'm, I'm yes, this is the book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wanted to just show you, they do have some hints on um, using a twin needle, decorative stitches. If you don't, I've always said, if you don't use your decorative stitches, you're not getting your money out of your machine. You don't have to have the top of the line machine to do decorative stitches. All of your machines will have some decorative stitches. It also talks about using trims. And years ago, I used to do a lot of classes on um, embellishing ribbon with decorative stitches. So I'm going to show you some of those ideas uh, right now. One of the things that's nice about the decorative stitches is you can use them for quilting. And this is a crazy quilt um, that I did a few years ago using decorative stitches um, to stitch in between the blocks. And so it makes it a really fun and easy way. And the other thing that's great about using your decorative stitches um, on your machine is you learn your machine. And so that's a, an added benefit. Now, I love making Annie's bags and all of her projects. They are wonderful. And um, one of the things that I decided that I would show you is if you want to make some kind of an organizer, this could be a sewing organizer, it could be uh, it could be organizers for jewelry or whatever if you make it smaller. But what you do is you create this uh, sandwich of your batting and your decorative stitches. And what I've done is I've stitched just regular satin ribbon with a decorative stitch before I have added my plastic bags. And one of the things that you can do with this it's, you know, a lot of the plastic bags come with writing on it. If you take rubbing alcohol and just take a cotton ball and rub it against it, it takes the writing off and that makes it just a lot nicer. And so you can put whatever you want in it um, and then roll it up and you're good to go. And what book is this from? Can you hold the book up? They wanted to know where you got the decorative stitches and, and the ideas. Actually, the it was it. inspired. The project is not in the book, but you can make it however big you want. But it was inspired by this right here. Um, the, can you show the front of the book? The front of the book. Take two fat quarters. This, they... They had you make a reversible placemat 
with decorative stitches. And I thought, for me, that is not practical. I wanted to do something else. And so I did this organizer here. And you can make it a narrower if you want to do it for lingerie. You can do it for jewelry, whatever. I made a larger one because I wanted to put sewing stuff in it. What and kind of bags are those that you used? These are just your regular Ziploc bags. But these have the sliders. I like the, be sure you get the ones with the sliders. But it's such a fast, easy thing, and you can use it for so many different things. And do you have any tips for following a line with your decorative stitches? Um, I use a, a foot that has either a cutout in the center or just a center guide. And the thing that's nice about your feet is most of the feet will fit a, a width of a ribbon. And so you can find one that's basically the width of your foot or a little bit um, a little bit wider. And then if you need to, you can draw a center line and follow that, or you can just eyeball it. Um, because if your ribbon is nice and narrow, you're not going to, it's not going to be super uneven. But I do use a glue stick, and I glue stick, and I also stabilize my stitches. And you can see here, um, I've glued it down, and the, the stitching just covers the ribbon. So it's just a really fun thing to try to and use your uh, decorative stitches. Now and this how is a. How do you attach your plastic bag? Sorry, we have several people ask that. How do you attach the bag? To oh, that? I forgot to tell you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, what you do is once you get this quilted and your ribbon embroidery on it, then you lay um, your bag up and you put a piece of ribbon and you top stitch it on each side. And then you can divide the bags with some more ribbon if you want to. And so I just um, have glued the bag up here, and then I put my ribbon across, and I double, I stitch on each side. And so that's how you attach the bag. So are the bags easy to replace if they get damaged? Um, you could unpick this, and you could put a new bag in and then stitch it down. Um, the only way that it might get uh, damaged, I, I think these will last you for a while, is if an iron got next to it. But other than that, I don't see that it's, it would be too much of a problem. Sharp sewing implements in there, they might hook up. Yeah, <laughs> sharp, sharp in sewing. I would put thread and, yeah. I w you know, a lot of our scissors now come with guards on it. Yeah and stuff like that. I also made a pillow with decorative stitches, and um, this is just some uh, different stitches off of my machine. And then I added the decorative stitches here for the closure of the pillow. But it's just a really fun way to, uh, if you don't have an embroidery machine, you can do wonderful embellishments with that. Okay, um, I think that's all on the decorative stitches. Now what I wanted to do is um, something that's really hot on the market right now are rope bowls. And um, I have taught these classes many years ago on where you cover your clothesline with fabric and then you zigzag it together. I've made uh, mats, I've made bowls, uh, I've made purses, lots of different things that you can do with it. But now what they're doing is they're having you just stitch the clothesline itself. And so if you want to do something uh, like these two bowls here, you can do round, you can do oblong. Uh, I've done ones where you have two round bottoms and the bag kind of angles out. Um, I brought this one just because I got it out for my Halloween treats. And it's just to show you that you can do two colors if you want. And this, you can just use scraps for this. And you can make a scrappy one if you want. Um, this one is done with some twill fabric. 
Um, actually, I had about a dozen unfinished bowls from when I used to teach classes, and this got me to finish them up. And so this is one, um, it's just like a tray. And so I'm going to go ahead and show you the ones that I did with just white clothesline. And we have embroidery in the bottom. This is what is really trending right now um, on the internet. And when you do this, you don't have to worry about uh, cutting your fabric strips, but if you want to, you cut fabric strips three quarters of an inch and then you just wind them around and I glue them when I start. I glue it when I end with just some uh, fabric glue stick or whatever. But these are a little bit different. These work up really quickly because you don't have to cut that fabric and you don't have to, to cover the bowls. And so when you choose something like this, you want to choose an embroidery that is not uh, highly digitized. And actually, um, I was kind of disappointed on how this one turned out. It's supposed to be fall leaves and the colors were beautiful together when you stitched it on black. But when you stitched it on white, it just was kind of disappointing to me. And that's a lesson that I learned many, many years ago on doing jean jackets. Your colors may look different on a certain piece of fabric. So I was a little bit disappointed on this, but um, nonetheless, it turned out uh, fine. And I'm gonna show you how to do this over at the machine here. This happens to be um, just a very shallow bowl. And it does have a poinsettia uh, embroidery on it. And I thought this would be a great Christmas card holder. You could just put it on your table um, in your entry or wherever you want to and just put your Christmas cards in it. So there's lots of options for these. So I'm going to go over to the machine and I'm going to show you how to put together um, these bowls here. Okay, you're going to start, oops, got to wait for my cameraman. You're going to start out with clothesline. And some of the, something that I found um, doing many of these, there's polyester clothesline and there's cotton clothesline. The polyester clothesline is going to be softer and the, co the cotton is going to end up being more stiff, but it doesn't matter, they both work. The thing that I wanted is I wanted white. Your clotheslines usually come in off white, and so I wanted white, so I sent my husband to Home Depot to see if he could find some white clothesline for me, and he did, and this is what I found at uh, Home Depot, it's called Ever Built, um, and it is a white. Uh, this is a little bit smaller. You want to use about a quarter of an inch. Uh, this is actually 3 sixteenths of an inch. It would work fine too, but um, they do suggest that you do a quarter inch, and that's what this is here, and I'm going to be showing you how to build the sides of your bowl. But first of all, I'm going to sit down at the sewing machine, and you want to go to a zigzag. Well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, when you start, what you're going to do is you are going to start coiling your fabric like this. And then once you get it to be about the size of a 50 cent piece, stick a uh, long pin, what do they call these pins, the long ones? Um, anyway, long pins, one going this way, one going this way. And then I'm going to stitch straight here and here. You want to use, um, let me just, uh, I've got too many things in my head right now. Um, a 75 embroidery needle, a size 75 embroidery needle is what they suggest. So I did stitch here, I backstitched, and then what I'm going to do is I am using an open toe foot. 
And this is a really old foot. It's a six millimeter open toe foot, but you want to be able to watch where your needle goes. Okay, so I've got an open toe foot on. And then I'm going to start, and you always want to feed it from the right hand side. It, you, um, if you're left handed, it'll probably be easier for you to feed it from the left hand side. But if you're right hand, um, you want to feed it from to the right hand side. And then what I do is I put my uh, coil under here, and then I'm going to zigzag catching. Uh, you're, uh, you're going to zig on one side and zag on the other. I'm not going to do it on this, but what I'm going to do it on is I'm going to show you how to do the bowl with the embroidery. So what you will do to do the bowl is you're going to make this coiled flat piece right here. You're going to decide how big your embroidery is going to be, and then you're going to print out a template. And so this embroidery, I believe, is about six by six. So I wanted to make an eight inch coil here. So I just started and just kept stitching and stitching and stitching until I got it to where I thought that it, I measured it and it was eight inches this way, eight inches this way. Now, if you notice right here, I have hash marks. What you do to get those hash marks is you lay your template right here and you mark it. I used a friction pen because they iron off. And then um, you put it in to, to your hoop. And when you do this, what I would suggest, you can do it however you want, but I really found that the tearaway sticky back stabilizer that you hoop up, it has a release paper, you draw around it with a, a sharp a pen, pin, just a, a pin, you score it with the pin and you pull the paper off, and then you put this down and pat it, and then the instructions that I found said you needed to sew it to your stabilizer. And I thought, poo poo, I'm not doing that. So this, it was sticky enough. Then I added the pink embroidery tape every inch or two here to, to tape it down to my stabilizer. It taped this to the stabilizer. And then you put it in your sewing machine and you embroider it. Now, one of the things that really surprised me when I did this is I thought I would have to raise my embroidery foot height, but I didn't. I had to lower it, which really surprised me. So play around with that. It's going to pop. It's going to pop. And it popped less when my embroidery foot was down one click on my machine. So once you get that embroidered, then what you do is you come back, you set your sewing machine for a zigzag stitch, and you want to use your needle down, and then you push this up to the side of your machine, and that is what starts the, the uh, angle to, to construct the sides of your bowl. Now, when I used to teach these classes years ago, we had maybe two brands of machines that we sold in our stores. I could tell you which bowls were done on a Foff machine and which bowls were done on a Brother machine because the size of the head is going to influence how your bowl um, how your bowl angles up. So all I'm going to do, whoops, I just, I need to get this down on the right hand side and I roll some of this out and then I just keep stitching. And I want to just do a little bit of the stitching so that you can see how I need to go faster. Does this ha this has a speed on it? It's on the side. Okay. 
whoops, wrong way. I haven't used the speed on mine. I guess I have it set for fast. Just keep your finger pushing that rope now so that it touches the other side. Now, one thing I will tell you, and I'm not watching this very carefully, I'm going to have some holes, but you can just go back and stitch those holes together because you're using a matching thread and nobody's going to see those stitches. I think we've got enough so that you can see. Now you can make it as, uh, whoops, wrong one. You can make it as uh, tall as you want. And you can see how it's starting to angle up. And so that's all you have to do. Now, my signature ending, I've always done this, is to coil around. I, I stop right about here and I leave you know, maybe a foot or two of that, depending on how big you want. Coil it, stitch it again with your hash marks, and then I just glue it to the side of the bowl. And it's an easy way to end it off. A lot of them you'll see uh, them to bring it up like this, but you don't have to. Um, yes. yes. Is this project in the book? Yes, it is. Two half. Two, take two fat quarters. Yeah. It talks about fabric coil bowls. Yes, it is. It doesn't tell you about the embroidery, but you can go out on the internet and put embroidered coil bowls, and it will tell you how you'll find a, a tutorial on doing that. But just doing the bowls, the regular fabric bowls, yes. And what stitch width and length did you use on your zigzag? I will tell you what I use on my icon. Um, I, if you, every machine, every machine model, it's going to be a little bit different. But on this one, I used a 5.0 width and a 4.5 uh, stitch length. Just practice around. You want it wide enough so that it will easily catch each end of your rope, of your clothesline. Um, and then I did some of these over at my trailer, and I have um, a 7570 Foff, which is way, way, way old, and so my stitches are totally different. So every machine's gonna have a little bit different, but just put a piece of fabric in your um, machine and stitch out uh, a sample of different widths and different lengths. You don't want the length too close together because you're just wasting thread and you're making it stiffer than it really needs to be. Kind of like quilting. If you put a lot of quilting on it, your quilt is heavier. If you do lighter quilting, it's not as heavy. But these bowls are really sturdy and you can wash them. Um, I don't know about embroidered ones if I'd wash them. Oh, one of the things I wanted to tell you, I did float a piece of tearaway stabilizer on the back. You probably don't need to do this, but I did. And then it just tears away and you don't even see it here. So that's just a suggestion that I had for you. Any other questions? What size needle did you use? Um, you're supposed to use a 75 embroidery needle, uh, a 75 embroidery needle, or a size um, 11. Okay. Yes, we're, I'm going to go to the ironing board, and we're going to talk about one of the funnest things that I did um, for so fun this time. Do you want to bring the trees over? And sure. We have a, a prize. We need a little okay. bell. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding. So this beautiful uh, charm pack. Um, no, layer, layer cake. cake. Layer cake. There you go. Uh, from Maywood Studios goes to Arlette Wentz. So congratulations. You can pick that up at your store of choice. Okay. We have a couple of really fun trees. I'm going to let Gail tell you about her tree, and then I'm going to tell you about mine, and I'm going to do a little demo. Yeah, so I have mine half, um, half decorated. So this one, 
Uh, she's going to talk about you know the different components of it, but I have four panels, and I did mine in blues rather than reds and greens. And we could either have undecorated or uh, let it up with uh, the little pixie lights. So you can uh, choose however that you wanted to decorate those. So um, Anne's going to explain how we put that together. It it was really a fun project. Um, I kind of got into it. And you know what? It has some free motion quilting. And all of our sofa ladies that know me know that I hate free motion. I will do anything to not have to free motion. But you know what? I had a lot of fun free motioning on this because it doesn't matter if you do a crappy job, it turns out fine. <laughs> and it's a great way to practice your free motion. And you can follow patterns or you can just do free motion, whatever. We are using uh, this pattern from, the, from Christine Poor, and this is called the Tabletop Tannenbaum. And um, it is a moldable tree. And what you're going to use is you're going to use this wonderful uh, moldable batting. And once you hit it with the iron, it shrinks up like that. What's that? Uh, texture magic. It doesn't shrink that much. Texture magic. It gets stiff. They do say that this will shrink up 30%, but we did not find that it shrank that much. So... Um, we have, I just wanted to show you, this is what it is. It looks just like regular batting, okay? But what Gail did is she ironed, this is a piece before ironing it, and she really ironed it. And it's more like the um, Peltex stuff, but it does shrink, it does shrink up. So that's what we're using. So how do you do this? Well, what you're gonna do, is you're going to take and copy off half of the pattern like this, okay? Then make two copies and tape it together like this. And this is what you're gonna, going to use. Then you're going to take your fat quarters, and you can use fat quarters, you can use yardage. Um, I used fat quarters for my tree here, and I used um, all different ones. And so you, you, on your fat quarter, what you're going to do is we'll pretend like this is our fat quarter. We're going to lay one tree this way and cut out the fabric. You're going to put two fat quarters together so you have um, the wrong sides facing the out, or you can put right sides inside, it doesn't matter. But you have two fat quarters. You cut out one tree this way, one tree this way, and then you cut out, I think it's eight or ten wedges out of that fat quarter stack, okay? So I hope I've explained. Show them the wedge, and then y'all just show explain what it oh, is. Oh, this is the wedge. And this is for the... Um, what do you call it? Tree skirt. Tree skirt? Yeah, that's, yeah, it is tree skirt. Anyway, that's what that, this is. You have to be kind of careful. Um, it'll all fit on there, but, you know, just don't have a lot of, of uh, um, a lot of width in between your trees, okay? So you're going to cut out five sets of your two fat quarters. Okay, five sets. They can be matching. I'm making this for my daughter, who's a minimalist, and she loves gold. And so I'm doing it all out of the same fabric. Now, we have Wonder Clips here, and we do have those on our website. These are great for a, a lot of the projects that we did today. And these jumbo ones are really great because they go over a lot of fabric, okay? So I'll be showing you that in just a second. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your sets, your sets of two uh, trees, and you're gonna lay them on your batting. And so that we'll pretend like this is fabric. So you're gonna lay it, this batting opens up, um, it's not real wide, but it's really long. So you put one this way, 
a set this way, a set this way, a set this way, a set this way. So you do five sets of two. Now, if you are confused about this, go to Shabby Fabrics. They have a wonderful tutorial on it. Just go on YouTube and um, it explains everything and you can pause it and do the thing that you need to do. And then you can play, put hit play again and it takes you and walks you right through that. Once you get them stitched onto your batting, you're going to trim around. And one of the things that I learned off of watching that YouTube video is you're going to trim down. Once this is stitched to your batting, you've got your two trees right sides together. You lay it on your batting. You stitch it all the way around, but you're going to leave it open here because you've got to turn it inside out, okay? But before you do that, you need to trim it. So you trim it down to a quarter of an inch all the way around. Then you're going to take some nice scissors that have a nice point, and you're going to clip into the corner. Clip first, then you're going to trim it down to an eighth of an inch. Because when you trim down to an eighth of an inch, you don't have to worry about the seam allowance getting in the way, okay? When you get to hear what she suggests on the YouTube video, and it worked really well, is you trim that batting down a quarter of an inch here so that everything will turn under nicely when you turn it inside out. So there's no batting for a quarter of an inch right here, and that worked really well. Okay, so once you get them sewn, you're going to turn them inside out, and then you're going to take a point turner, and you're going to push all those little points out. You do no ironing until you get to this stage, okay? No ironing until you get to this stage. We just, every time we turn something inside out, we think we have to press it. But what you're going to do is you're going to turn it inside out. You're going to kind of smooth it with your hand. And then you're going to stitch about an eighth of an inch all the way around the tree, closing your opening right here. Then you're going to do your free motion. If you want your free motion to show, use a contrasting thread. Well, guess what? I didn't want my free motion to show, so I used a thread that matched. And I had a lot of fun doing this. Everybody's, all the ladies that know me, they're going to say, you actually enjoyed free motion? Yes, I actually enjoyed free motion on this. So once you get your free motion done, what you're going to do is you have five trees. You're going to stitch a set of two together down the center here. You're going to make two of those sets. So you've got a set with two trees stitched together and another set with two trees stitched together. And then you have one lone tree that you stick in between and you put a, um, before you turn them right side out, when you're stitching them, you put a little hanger here so that you can put a star. I put a star here on mine. I just glued it on. Um, so now I want to show you how they shrink. Now I have to tell you that Gail and I sort of jumped the gun when she made hers and I made mine. We pressed them before we stitched them together. It's okay to do that, but I'll tell you, I mean, it, it's fine to do that, but it's a lot easier to stitch them together because you're going to have five trees. So once you get the two sets of trees plus the one in between it, you have to hand stitch it through here. Now, the, the gal that did the video said that her Bernina would go through it. So if you have a Bernina machine, check that out. Um, Gail said she used her industrial machine to go through it. But what I did was I just used some button uh, craft thread, some thicker thread, and a doll needle, and just stitched it here. So what I want to do now is I want to show you how it uh, shrinks up. And I should have had my iron on. i got to wait for just a second um, for my iron to heat up. 
Um, let me tell you about putting uh, the tree together once you get it uh, shrunk up. If you can see, you're gonna stitch right, you're gonna stitch it right here, right here. See the sections of the tree skirt? You're gonna stitch a section by hand on each of these so that it, it fluffs out and you get a well-rounded tree. Now, I have a sneaky suspicion, since I didn't do this like this, this is going to be a more well-rounded tree than uh, when I did them individually, but we'll see. I just use decorative stitches to do my quilting on the tree skirt. Um, you can kind of see them here, they're just circles and stuff. And you shrink it up and then you stitch it on and it just sets right nice on your table. Okay, let's see if we are, okay, I've got an iron here, and let me see if I can, if you can see how I kind of need to hold, let me hold this up, it's, the iron's kind of in the way, but you're going to see how it's starting to shrink up. Can you see that? How it's starting to shrink up? And what does it? You don't want to put the iron right down on it. You want to hold it up. And if you wear glasses, take them off maybe. Because <laughs> you're going to... But can you see how this is molding and shrinking up? And then all you have to do is just take your hand and you mold it like that and you have a nice tree. Now I would shrink this up a little bit more, um, but... Do you use steam and what temperature? Um, you're supposed to use cotton, but I, I have mine on three dots, which is cotton and linen. You do but, want the steam. It said you could use a commercial steamer, you know, like a... Yeah, you could a use a, a commercial steamer. You are using the steam, not the... Because it's the, the steam that is shrinking it. But you don't want your iron down on it. And then, once again, just mold it like this. And then I would go on. Can you see the difference between the two sections here once it's been shrunk? If I wanted it shrunk up more, I could add more steam because they say um, that it will shrink 30%, but Gail didn't find that it shrunk that much. I don't think it shrinks that much. Better. And in this, in this project, you want the, the shrinkage, correct? Yes. That's what's making yeah. it stand up. That's um, what, you want the moldability. Yeah. yeah, you want the moldability, and can you see how it's starting to just stand up by itself? Just a really fun project. And if you've got Christmas fat quarters around, I mean, you don't have to do it out of Christmas fabric. You could have an Easter tree or whatever you wanted, but um, it really works out nice, and it's a really fun project. You could mold it to any shape you want. You could take a piece of this product and make a bowl out of it or right. make whatever you want out of it. But there is a large enough piece in this package to make this project yes and i mentioned at the very beginning she's talked about five trees five panels um, that she's put together um, mine only has four because i wanted to keep a piece um, just to play with maybe christmas ornaments because um, you can sew them up embroider something first then um, add this and you know maybe little circles or a little whatever shape you want and then they'll be nice and stiff it's a great idea yeah and I have not tested it out, but I don't know how many times you can heat and mold this. Um, but you could, if it wasn't sewn down, you know, because mine doesn't have a, a skirt, um, re-steam it, flatten it, store it away next year, re-steam it, and yeah, set it back up again. So That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. If we have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. If not, we're going to go back up to the table. All right, the drunkard's path. So we have templates today uh, to make the drunkard's path block. 
and I'm just going to grab them to this one. So they come in two different sizes, uh, two different size sets of templates, but those templates make um, four different size blocks, and we have many different um, samples up here. The patterns for the quilts themselves are just patterns that we went out and found somewhere. So the idea is just to get your uh, Drunkard Path blocks done. And if um, I'll show you some samples of those here in a second. Um, but then you can just go find whatever pattern you want. So um, I will go grab those, I think. Actually, we're going to you know, wander that way and um, cut some out. So take both of these. So here are the different uh, sizes of blocks. So this is called the six inch set. This will make both a six inch block with the circle bisecting the side right here and the large section down here, you know, being um, fairly wide, about a third of the block or so. This is a six inch finished block. But the same template has a little dotted line part way down the middle, and that will make your block um, like this, where once you do your quarter of an inch seam allowance, the curve of your drunkard's path comes out on the corner. And that allows you to do totally different patterns. So then with the eight inch set, it will make a six inch finished that ends at the corner, or an eight inch finished that ends on the sides here. Now what's special about this particular set of templates is they have all of these little um, cuts in them and I'll take them out of the package here. Here's my set. So when you cut out these pieces you can run a rotary cutter down the little cuts on the inside and the outside of your curve and then when you sew your pieces together they will match back up again. So we need a couple of rotary cutters. Um, this is just one rotary cutter. This is from Fiskars. This uh, you can use for the outsides and the curves or any other long um, quilting cutting that you need to do. This is a repositionable one. I can use it as a bent over like this. It's very ergonomic. Uh, I can pull that out of the way. The guard. Um, or I can push the button and I can have it go to either uh, the left or the right for right-handed people or left-handed people. And that's going to be uh, more ergonomic. Your wrist is uh, turned a little bit different angle. Or I can have it all the way up here so I can use it um, straight on. So I can use it like this. So that is adjustable. Now we did bring these in. Um, they're on our list. We've had a little bit of an issue with supply. So we have a limited number of these at, uh, at this time, but that is the um, Fiskars rotary cutter. When you do these, um, you will need a 45 or a 28 millimeter cutter to get into these little cuts. And the cuts are very deep across your seam line, but if you have the, the larger blades, they can't get that far. So by the time the blade hits back here, it's not cutting all the way through your seam allowance. So that's okay. So what that has done is made these little cuts. And you're really not gonna be able to see those. There, I think you might be able to see those. Okay. So I have ins and outs. Um, actually, all the ins made my samples up there. Um, here's the outs. So the same piece of fabric I used to cut, you know, both 
the in and the out. So if you set them like this on your fabric piece, um, you're not wasting any. It depends on your quilt pattern. Um, you can have lights and darks. The, the quilt um, that we have on that right over there, um, you can mix and match and have Um, you know, dark on the outside, dark on the inside, um, light on the inside, light on the outside. So um, we're going to wander over and sew one of these together, and I'll show you why those little cuts are so nice. So we're going to go right over here to the sewing machine. Uh, if you want to set up, right here, okay. inch foot. So I am using a quarter of an inch foot, so I have the guide. And I don't have to uh, use pins for this method, or I choose not to anyway. And I can have the walking foot engaged on this buff. I am going to have um, this outside curve go this way on the bottom, and I'm going to have this curve goes this way on the top piece. Two of these here. Yes. I have a zigzag. Thank you. Straight stitch. Straight stitch is important. Okay. So when I when I start this block, it's going to look kind of weird because I've got one going that way and one going that way, but trust me, they will um, come out in the end. And if you want to put a pin here, you can to get started. But you'll notice my little clips line up um, right there. And then my next set of clips are uh, going to line up right there. But the reason I lay these out this way is I want to be able to move my hands out like this towards me and have um, this one go this way and this one go this way. All right, so as I start stitching up here, okay, as I get to each clip, I know if I need to stop um, if I need to tug on one or the other, um, these are on the bias. So as I move them this way, my clips line up. And I don't get all the way to the end and realize that, oh no, they really didn't match after all. So now I notice that, you know, this clip is a little bit farther um, towards me than this one. So I'm just going to put a little bit of pressure on this. And stretch it. And there I'm right on the edge at the end. So I can either press them out or press them in. The little clips are also handy uh, for pressing. They're already there. So um, I don't have to go back and clip my edges since it is on a curve. Um, and I'm ready to piece that into whatever pattern that I want. So Lori made this beautiful uh, quilt that's on the front of our table up here. And looks like um, you know, split circles, lights and darks, uh, some light on the inside, some light on the outside. From 10 inch squares. Uh, yeah, these are from Layer Cakes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a beautiful way to lay those out. And this was the eight inch template in its largest form. So those are um, eight inch finished. And I took the six inch template set and cut the smaller size. So mine are four inch finished. But having them come out on the corners allows me to run these together into a wave. And my pattern, um, I got the idea out of the uh, Missouri Star uh, quilt block, one of her books, and um, just made it fit um, my fabrics. So, and Anne, you want to talk about yours? Well, 
One of the, the reasons I love to work with Gail is she's very creative. I am very balanced. I have been trying to become unbalanced for the last 27 <laughs> plus years of doing so fun and it has not worked out. But um, I had a lot of fun using the templates as well. And um, I found a pattern on the internet and I fell in love with it the way it looked, and it was purples. Of course, I love purple. You can see that I do. Um, but I really liked the way it looked, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do something um, with this pattern for the holidays. So I chose a couple of pattern, a couple of different uh, pieces that I had in my stash, and I put it together, and guess what my daughter said? She goes, Mom, that's Pac-Man. Pac <laughs> but you know what? I still like it. I still like it. But you can tell I'm the more balanced type of person. Um, I, I would love to be artistic and think outside the box, but I'm usually trying to claw my way out of the box. This actually is the 8-inch template. And then I used edge-to-edge -edge quilting to quilt it and did uh, just put a binding on it. And I have some fun fabric here on the back. The next one, oh, excuse me, this is the 6-inch. This right here is the 8-inch. And I decided, this is called Swell fabric. It's a, it was new last year. It's still out this year. And I had some fat quarters, and so I decided to um, just make, I had to make four blocks of four sections each. And then to quilt it, I just used a poinsettia embroidery design. One of the things that I noticed when you do this and you use um, just a quilting design here in the center, if you had a border on, it wouldn't be wavy. It's a little bit wavy. And I think if I would have put a border on, it would have laid a little bit nicer. But I really like it without the border with the embroidery as the quilting. Um, one thing that we're finished with these samples, right? No, uh, I have, there was a couple of questions. Oh, okay. I'm going to go over on this. So there was a question about how I got the wave and it's all in how the blocks lay and the color of the fabric. So this was definitely a design wall project. Actually it was the bed. I did it on the bed, but um, you do have to uh, make them and lay them all out um, and to make sure you got them going the right way. So this is the block. This was the six inch template cut down to four inches. So I just got a little bit of this outer piece poking through and a large chunk of all of my colors. And I picked my rainbow colors. So let's just start at the top corner. And here I had the blue and the lavender. And down here I had this um, raspberry color and the lavender. Still with the lavender here. And then when I moved over to here, the lavender takes up this section and the blue is this section. So this is my block. This is my block. This is my block. And to lay it all out and plan it, like I said, I did see it in that book, but then I had to do it my way, my colors. Um, I did bring it into EQ6, which is Electric Quilt 6. Uh, they have a 7 now. Um, that is just a way to plan quilts on the computer. And then I could color them in and say, um, you know, I want it to look like this. What colors do my blocks need to be? And this actually ended up 10 colors. 10 of these, 10 of these, of each of 10 colors, and, um, oh, that's not right, because there's 80 blocks, but something like that. Um, so I cut an even number of these. So I had, um, you know, I was able to cut, um, maybe it's eight of those and eight of those, and it, they just all work in a different place. And these two, don't get duplicated, but as I went down the row, um, this one shows up again up here. This one shows in, you know, get up here, so I can get out some paper or get, you know, together a, a like electric quilt six and plan it out. The quilting is all uh, free motion, 
um, waves and the stars that are on here are actually um, this from the back. So I quilted in some of these from the back and then went around them to do all my waves. So I hope that answers those questions. What is the name of the book? Well, this particular pattern came out of the Missouri Star um, Block. When it's their monthly magazine or bi-monthly magazine called Block. And so it was on, I don't remember the month. It was just, I looked through a whole bunch of magazines and books uh, to try to find some Drunkard's Path patterns, and that's what showed up. So. Does EQ7 provide a layout ability to enter the size of fabric? Yes. Yes. You can actually take images of your fabric and plug it in there if you would like to. But it tells you how much to cut, you know, how many blocks you need of what. And it does all that stuff for you. Did you have a... Um, I did on forget it? one project when I was talking about the rope bowls. And I have made a tic-tac-toe board right here for my little grandson. And the reason that I thought of this is years ago I made a table runner with applique circles and I made some trivets with the rope bowl uh, technique and he had them out and he was playing tic-tac-toe only there were just two rows of the, the circles. And so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and make, uh, my husband told me I had to make five of each so that uh, he would have enough. So I did some gray ones, I did some red ones, and these are great coasters or even trivets. And then he has his little mat here. Um, his birthday's coming up in December, so that's what he's getting. This is a technique that we did in So Fun a few years ago for a quick drawstring bag. All you do is you just make a casing here at the top and um, a lining, and then you just put the cording through and you can draw it up like that. I don't like making drawstring bags where you have to stitch and leave open and turn it. This is so much faster, so much easier. And then his little game pieces and his little mat, he can fold up just put him in the bag, and away he goes. So that was one of the projects that I did using the technique for the coil bowls. Okay, we are on to bath time buddies. I had a lot of fun doing this because um, I, have, I have a little great grandson and my youngest grandson is, uh, they're only a month apart in age. They just turned a year. And so I started making hooded towels. And when this particular um, CD came out uh, on our, one of our lists, um, I thought it would be really fun to do. There are a lot of different designs and they have designs for girl uh, hoodies and for boy hoodies. And so in the CD, you get everything that you need. The designs are all multi-formatted and you get the whole instruction on how to do the towel. Um, Gail, do you want to show them your towel? Sure. And then I'll go ahead and yep. uh, show so them. So there's, um, in the collection, there's a lion, there's a turtle, there's a panda, there's a raccoon, there's a fawn, a giraffe, an elephant, and a fox. So I'll just leave that right there. These are from OESD, Scissor Tails. And um, here is my little boy giraffe for my little grandson. I just have the one uh, grandson who is just over a year as well. So um, very cute. And this is actually opens up. You use a bath towel and a hand towel size um, to make a little hooded bath towel. So they can wrap up in that and get all dried off and, and be cute while they're doing it. So they work great. Um, I'm going to show you this. I did a, a little lady, a little girl fox, and then I did this little raccoon here. But I wanted to open this up and show you that you can add some embellishments if you want. 
the way that you fold it is you fold the towels in thirds and then you roll them. But on this one, I added rickrack down where you have your towel indentation here. And so it works really well. Everything is finished off. And I'm going to explain to you how you do uh, a hood and you don't have that seam showing it's all finished off. This is, um, this is something that I learned when I made these towels um, before this CD came out. So I'm going to talk to you about that. But yes, you just use a hand towel and a bath towel. Now I'll tell you, you want to use towels that are not super thick because by when you do finish them off here, you're going to be doing a French seam so it's finished off uh, completely. And it's two, I bought some towels at Costco thinking I could do this with them. They were way too thick. So you can go um, around our area, you can go to Target, you can go to Fred Meyer and, you know, get the towels that aren't super, super thick and you'll be uh, happy that you did that. Now, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to do an applique in your hoop. And one of the things that I really like about this CD is that when you stitch, you're going to hoop up a tearaway uh, stabilizer. And I used a sticky back tearaway stabilizer, or you can use a tearaway with some spray adhesive. Um, either way works fine. And you put that, you put that uh, stabilizer into your machine, and then the first thing that you do is you stitch out a line that tells you where to put the towel, to line the towel up on that line. And with all the others that I've made, they've never given me that line. And so I really appreciated that because you can get the design right on the edge of your towel. And then you're going to embroider it out. It's an applique. I did um, use a very light weight stable, uh, excuse me, interfacing on this fabric because it showed through. White does show through. So I did just do a little bit of interfacing on that. And you're going to go ahead and stitch it out. And then you're going to create your hood. Now she on the CD that we have, she tells you how to do your hood, but I wanted to show you a really fun uh, way to do your hood so that everything is finished off and you don't have a raw seam down here the back of the hood. So all you have to do is once you get your embroidery embroidered out, you put right sides together and you measure halfway and you're going to fold this in half here put some pins so that you get it nice and even and then you measure down half of the width of your towel make a mark and i marked on each end and then i took a ruler and i had to use a chalk pencil on this but um, you could even use a sharpie because it's not seen and you mark that line and then you just stitch it together. You stitch it um, right sides together. You just stitch right along this line. And then when you turn it inside out, let me get it here. It's stitched together here at the back and you poke the little hood out and then it's all finished off on the inside. And then what you do is you base these edges, this edge, these two edges together right here, and then you put it onto your towel like you would a French seam with wrong sides together, stitch it onto your towel, and then you flip that seam allowance up and top stitch it, and it ends up looking like this on the back, and then this is where you flip the edge up and top stitched it. So it works out really well. And once you tie them, you roll them and tie them, the kids just love them. So it's a really fun project. 
and you can use towels that you have around. You don't have to go out and buy new towels. Um, if you had terry cloth fabric, you could, you know, make these because she, they do give you the measurements there. So those are the bath time buddies. Um, lots of fun. And now we're going to move on to so, so organized. And these are our three little organizers here. And I made two because I wanted to show you how the frame goes in. Um, super easy to do. One of the things um, Gail did, like they said, she did three pockets. I did two pockets instead so you can decide if you want to do three pockets or two pockets you can use two fat quarters you can use scraps um, you can use two uh, three colors i use three colors of scraps <clears throat> excuse me on this one um, the only thing that you need to remember is if you are using fabric that is uh, one way fabric I have my pocket on upside down, but you know what? It's so busy, nobody's gonna know the difference. <laughs> you have um, this little uh, pocket here that has elastic in it, and you even get the elastic and the frame and the pattern all together. Make sure when you're doing your little pocket here that you pull, the elastic will be stitched on each end. You kind of pull it like that and get it even, and then stitch your, uh, increments of your pocket. And then we have a little uh, pin cushion here that you can put. There's a, a few little scraps of batting in that. Um, as I say, these are really easy to put together. So I'm going to show you how they come off the frame. We have a frame here and we have stitched this. I'm going to just turn it inside out so you can see how easy it goes together. This is interfaced with, they suggested uh, Shirt Taylor from Pellon, I think it's uh, uh, Pellon 150. Um, I used to use it all the time when I did, um, I taught uh, Pendleton tailoring, but I didn't have any, so I did buy a little scrap. It works really well. But all you're going to do is you're going to put everything right sides together. They suggest that you stitch the sides first and then stitch the top. Um, cut your corners, turn it inside out. Poke your corners out with your point turner. And then all you have to do is just make sure that this is facing back and you just slip that inside and you're good to go. So you can use this as a desktop organizer. You could leave the pin cushion off if you wanted to and just use it as a desktop organizer. Okay, we are ready to move on yes. to the last pattern. Before that, oh. we have ding, 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 prize. So um, this is a beautiful pattern called Eye of the Beholder. And this is a reverse applique pattern um, for Dorothea Hannon. So congratulations. Okay, you may have noticed my uh, change in wardrobe. So <laughs> our next pattern is a pajama pattern from uh, Jaylee Fabrics or Jaylee Patterns. It's called uh, Janine. Uh, Jean, Jean, anyway. It is pajamas, and these patterns, if you're not familiar with this company, uh, make multi-size patterns. So they go from two all the way up to 24, 26, I don't know, a um, lot of pattern, and everything in between. So all of the patterns are right here. You just uh, take another piece of um, paper, pattern paper, and you're gonna draw out the one that you need. Um, for your size, and then you've got uh, the rest of the pattern for everybody else in your family. So, these are tops and bottoms. Do you want to show yours? Yes. Um, one of the things about this pattern is that it really is very economical because you can make from size 2 
up to size 24 or 26. This actually is for my little five-year-old grandson. It is a size six, and it goes together. I really can't tell you anything about this pattern uh, that is special or whatever. It's just a, it's a wonderful pajama pattern. And one of the things about the pattern is that the, the leggings fit, the pajama bottoms fit like leggings. And when I took this over to try it on my little grandson, he was so excited he was running all over the house because my son actually has in, built into his budget, it's a Lego budget. That's one of the categories. So my little grandson loves Legos. And I did get this fabric online. I think I got it from fabric.com. But these go together really fast. Um, there's ribbing here now. Sometimes ribbing is hard to find. Um, but you could just use, make self-ribbing um, out of the, the uh, fabric here. Um, what else can I say? I'm just excited to, to have him wear it. And um, it was all done on the serger. Um, very quick, very easy. Um, okay, Gail. <laughs> All right. So I made two uh, sets. I made a set for myself. And uh, here are the leggings. And here are, um, is the top. So long sleeve. Um, as she mentioned, you can use regular ribbing. This is just a knit. It's a little bit tighter weave than um, this fabric. It's got a neck band on it as well and elastic at the waist. Now, I was going through a friend's um, ribbing, because I didn't have a lot of ribbing either, and something occurred to me. I've got some sweaters at home that maybe have um, a hole in them or a stain on them, and you don't know what to do with them. You can always cover it up with embroidery. But if it's anything like the shirt that I was wearing earlier that has this really nice, big, fat weave in it, uh, that would make great ribbing. So you can um, always go, go through your, your drawers. And then uh, this set I made for my grandson. It'll probably have to wait for him to grow into it just a little bit. This is the smallest size. This is a size two. But they're Seahawk spans. So um, this is a fleece. This pattern would fit um, with anything that stretches. So you can make it out of um, whatever you want. He and I actually have matching ribbing. We don't have matching outfits, but matching ribbing, close enough. And uh, you're not gonna get lost in these pants, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so I hope uh, everyone enjoyed uh, So Fun today. And I don't know if you have any closing um, I just, yeah, I would like to just tell all of our uh, customers and uh, that we are going to be doing an open house in December and you will see projects from all of the consultants and this is our way of thanking you for being our customers so look for that we'll be announcing that uh, shortly and uh, we will be and that, that is that in person or is that online it is virtual it is a virtual, sorry, I didn't think to say that because I'm in such a virtual mode. But yes, it is going to be virtual. We will be sharing projects with you and having some fun things uh, for you to do. So thank you for joining us. Um, it's been a wonderful um, presentation that we have had so much fun putting together and we hope that you've gotten some ideas. Table top seam ripper. Oh, yes. He got buried over here, sorry. But wait, there's more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Um, I'll bring it over here. Okay, so this is going to be our table. Huh? It won't stick to that. No. Yeah, so this is our tabletop seam ripper. And. <laughs> sorry. Oh. Um, and it does have a little protective cap. I don't know where the camera is on here. Um, but this has actually has a clamp. And this is a suction cup type clamp. And you're going to clamp that down uh, to your table. And then it's going to stay in place. So you can uh, chain piece your different blocks together. 
and then you can cut them apart against um, the seam ripper that stays where you want it because you would have this clamped right to your table and then you can just um, use that to draw against and then just reposition it someplace else and put that little uh, lid back on so you don't poke yourself so this is from Fiskars and uh, it's a wonderful addition to your sewing room thank you for the question there Any other questions? All right, well, thank you everybody. <laughs> Till next time. Thank you.